Right. Welcome back. We are going to talk now about the difference between post hoc highlighting and another approach, which is called select then predict. And this is related to uh, broader concepts beyond highlighting. Uh, one of them is post hoc explainability, and the other one is inherently interpretable models. So I never referenced this book before, but it's actually a really nice resource. And um, I recommend checking it out. And it's not maybe too specific to NLP and computer vision, uh, like um, you know the applications that we are looking in this class. Uh, but it's still really, really a nice uh, resource. And in this book, you can find these two definitions: uh, definition about inter intrinsic interpretability being um, the, referring to models that are considered inherently interpretable due to their simple structure, such as short decision trees or sparse linear models. And we also have self-explaining models trained to predict and provide explanations for their predictions. Uh, and here, uh, explanations are an integral part of the overall learning paradigm. Um, we have seen an example of that with three text explanations that we have trained uh, to produce a sequence that included a label together with the explanation in plain English. But another example of, an ex of a model like this would be to train a fact-checking system where you are producing a label that says whether a claim is factually correct or not, but you are also showing evidences in documents that are related to this um, claim. So this is, this is um, kind of explanation, not in the output, but rather in the uh, documents you are giving similar to highlighting. Um, and as we have seen in this class, we are not dealing with these short decision trees or sparse linear models. Um, we are instead having transformer models. And I'll come actually to the point I wanted to say uh, uh, in a moment in the next slide. But first, I want to um, define post hoc interpretability, which refers to the uh, application of interpretation methods after model training. And gradient-based highlights are uh, an example of such uh, interpretability or explainability uh, method, where we have first trained a model, and then after we have trained it, we have used this gradient with respect to some output function that relates to its predicted labels uh, to say which parts of the input are important. So these two terms are important, intrinsic interpretability versus post hoc interpretability. And there are arguments uh, for both of these. So in uh, Sinithia Rudin's seminal paper, she says um, the title of the paper is Stop Explaining Black Box Machine Learning Models for High Stakes Decisions and Use uh, Interpretable Models Instead because they are easier to troubleshoot, more useful in practice, uh, and so on. Um, and while this is the case, maybe for short decision trees and sparse linear models, uh, when we try to build these inherently interpretable models in NLP and computer vision, <laughs> these arguments, um, you know, people will still use them to motivate these approaches. And that's actually pretty valid argument for introducing a model like that. But they are still way more complicated than short decision trees or sparse linear models. So they can still, their explanations can still, um, still have the problem of faithfulness. They, we, we still might not be able to say that in these, these are the reasons for uh, why the model made a prediction. And I just want to, you to remember that point because I don't want you to write papers where you're like, okay, I have produced self-explaining neural model and uh, therefore we have a guarantee that our explanation is uh, fateful. Um, it is, it, you still need to, need to show that your uh, explanation is fateful because uh, some things might, be go, might go wrong, uh, as I will mention later on. Uh, by showing you an example from Yakovi and Goldberg, the paper we keep bringing up, uh, where they say explanations provided by currently interpretable models must be held to the same standards as post hoc uh, interpretation models. So have that have that in mind that um, just because you have making assertion that your model is inherently interpretable, that doesn't give you a pass to not show that the explanation produced is truly faithful when you're working with large uh, transformer models. 
All right, so um, just to recap, we have now introduced two new terms, inherently interpretable versus post hoc explainability methods. Um, and we have gone over the arguments why inherently interpretable models might be a good idea. And I have told you that still you need to watch out that you uh, showcase the faithfulness of your inherently interpretable uh, models and their explanations. So now um, I wanna shift gears and come back to what I said I will talk about today. And that's uh, kind of an alternative to the gradient-based highlighting, which is post hoc. Uh, you can also do a so-called select and predict approach where you are still going to highlight input tokens or pixels but you are going to do that um, in a way that's inherent to the model. So let me let me show what I mean by that. Uh, here we have some kind of um, beer review uh, and in select and predict approach, first thing we are going to do is actually extract which words here are important uh, for predicting a label of this review. So we have poor, a dark amber color with decent head that does not recede much. It's a tad too dark to see the carbonation, but fair as well, and so on. So maybe from reading this, we can already said with decent could be uh, a signal for a positive review. Um, not receding sounds also good uh, for, for this um, product. A uh, tad too dark, mm, hint of negative, and so on. So we we kind of have a sense of which one of to which tokens uh, we should select to to make a prediction here. So once once we do that, and here we have predicted some, uh, we are going to make a prediction uh, based only on those phrases that we have ended up selecting. So you're not going to make a prediction based on the entirety of this uh, beer review. You're just going to make a prediction based on a dark amber color with decent head, a tad too dark to see the carbonation, but fair as well. Um, everything else will be mask. So this is different from post hoc. Uh, highlighting because this uh, rationale extractor, here we are using rationale because uh, that's the terminology which was used in this select and predict uh, um, papers. But remember, I told you it's better to use highlighting. So we could also call this highlight extractor. So highlight extractor is integral part of the whole model. And we are going to train the model to do this. Um, it is not done in a post hoc way like we did with uh, first approach we have seen. Uh, important here is that with select and predict um, predict uh, approaches, you're not going to use human written highlights usually uh, to supervise the model, but rather you're going to just use whatever was the predicted label and then back propagate through the entire uh, stack. Uh, and this will be a weak supervision for the highlight or rationale extractor. So just based on what we ended up predicting and whether that was a good prediction or not, we can tell to highlight extractor, hmm, you gave me good highlights and therefore I was able to predict the sentiment or the highlights were not good and therefore the loss was huge and you should fix the, uh, the extraction part. All right, so um, um, I think we, we all, all know this by now, but highlights, original call rationales are defined as subset of words that um, uh, represent short and coherent pieces of text and alone sufficient, suffice for prediction as a substitute of the original text, which we call sufficiency. And in a, in a follow-up paper, uh, there was another property that was mentioned that we know by now, and that's that the highlight that we have um, you know, um, extracted represent all the evidence that supports the prediction that these tokens that are not selected do not predict the label. All right, um, I will talk about this first property that were initially uh, proposed in late et al. And this paper, Le uh, et al, uh, let me remind myself what is the title of the uh, paper, is called Rationalizing Neural Predictions. So this is a super important and very seminal paper. Um, I definitely recommend reading it, despite you know it being from 2016. Uh, it is uh, it is a paper that introduced this approach, and with this approach, this whole line of work 
on uh, select select and predict approaches, which you will see if you if you go to ACL anthology with you know NLP papers, you will see so many papers that try to do something uh, similar. All right, so how we can uh, do this uh, following approach introduced in Lay et al. Uh, we would introduce the following uh, training objectives. So first of all, we are going to, uh, the goal will be to assign a binary value. We'll call it ZT, where T uh, denotes a token in the input. Um, and this binary value will be zero, which means do not highlight this word or do not deem this token important. And one is, yeah, highlight it because it's important for the prediction. Um, and to, to um, achieve coherent pieces of text, we are also going to introduce this term where um, uh, basically what this term means is if you want to minimize it, you would minimize it if the binary value of the previous token and the current token are the same. For example, zero, zero. We are not now including uh, or starting a new important spam. Or if both of the tokens are important, meaning we have started an important, uh, important spend within the important tokens and we are continuing and we don't want to now to transition to not important tokens. And we are also going to model this um, sequence of binary values as a, as a basically language modeling. So what we de decide in the current token will depend on what we have decided for the previous tokens. To achieve short uh, highlights, meaning that we do not select too many tokens, we are going to take the norm of the vector that contains all the binary values uh, across all input tokens, and we will want to minimize it. Remember, because these values are zero or one, uh, and only, only um, thing that can contribute to the norm of a Z is if we had selected uh, certain tokens into highlight and therefore change their Z value to one. All right, and then uh, because we want this, um, this highlight that we have selected and short and uh, coherent to be a substitute for the original text, we want it to, on its own, to predict the, to be predictive of the label. Uh, as, a, as our loss function, we are going to use the difference uh, between the, label we get when we mask uh, certain tokens in the input and we don't mask them not any tokens but those determined by the z values and uh what were, whatever was the uh, whatever is the gold label so basically what this says is based on only um if we zero out tokens token embeddings were that's not highlighted just based on that, we should be able to minimize uh, the difference between the predicted label and the gold label. All right, so finally, our cost or training objective will be uh, this loss such as have just described together with the omega z, which is defined by this term that sums the, uh, that encourages short and coherent pieces of text. All right, so that's our objective function. And the problem here, as I mentioned, not a problem, but thing we want to do is that binary selections are not supervised by human written highlights, but rather um, we are just doing the weak supervision for all the pre uh, predicted, um, um, predicted um, label for the sentiment, let's say. So what we do here when we don't have an observed binary uh, values is minimize the expected loss. This is a standard way to produce, to turn your objective into uh, uh, an objective that you want to uh, minimize once you don't have the observed um, latent variables. And this is challenging as it involves summing over all the possible choices of, of highlights, which there are many, especially with longer inputs. Mm -hmm. And what this paper, Lei and Tal, that I mentioned show is that we can uh, sample a few highlights Z and use the resulting average gradient in an overall stochastic gradient method. And this is more commonly known as the reinforced style algorithm. 
So instead of uh, um, you know summing over all the possible choices of highlight, you you are just sampling a few and and using the average of their gradients for the for the backlog. All right. The problem is with this is that reinforce is slow. And now I will mention what you can do here. I don't want to go into details of this paper, uh, but the different view from assigning you know, binary va variables, which are very strict, zero or one, you can imagine that you have some kind of distribution for each one of the uh, tokens and you sample from that distribution and then uh, you get something which is kind of close to the binary vari variables, not really exactly zero or one. So here, for example, we have 0 0.2. Um, and if such a distribution has a smooth inverse CDF, then we can use something known as reparametrization trick, which was a very important uh, technique when um, instead of transformers, people were using uh, VAE, which stands for variational autoencoders. Um, so a kind of very, very high level of reparametrization trick is that you have some kind of uh, situation where you have your um, latent variable Z and you do not have observed values for the Z. So you want to kind of move that source of randomness uh, uh, to some other variable uh, epsilon. And you can do that if you uh, can represent G with uh, a CDF, um, sorry, with a, with a distribution that has a inverse uh, CDF. Um, so, all right, uh, now we know if we would like to erase this view and instead of having, you know, zero one binary variables, instead we have some distribution we sample from and teach token, um, we could do that if we find a distribution that kind of has values that are like those binary values. So very often the, it's going to sample zero or one and sometimes something that's not zero or one, but close to zero or close to one. And to be able to use this reparametrization trick, we also want that distribution to have um, a smooth inverse CDF. So, um, all right, this kind of repeats what I said. You, we need a, a distribution properties that are bounded with zero and one, mass probability should be around zero and one, and the inverse CDS should be smooth for reparametrization trick. And in this paper by Bastin et al, they indeed identify one uh, such distribution called Kumara-Savami distribution. And they also do rectify and stretch technique to include zero and one in the support of this distribution. So now we do have a distribution that has all the properties and uh, we can do the reparametrization trick, which means, all right, we have our encoder and then the parameters we learn are A and B, which are parameters of the uh, uh, distribution we are gonna use. It has two, two parameters. And we want to learn those parameters, then we can sample from this distribution. So instead of a model assigning zero or one at each token, you are gonna sample from the distribution. And then you will have um, rationales that, uh, excuse me, then you will have tokens that are either included or not included in your highlights. And then based on those that are included in your highlights, you can do the classification as you did before when uh, we had actually had binary variables. All right, follow up to, to this approach is that, all right, this is all great, but it's still pretty unstable and hacky and we don't uh, don't um, always get results as we had expected. So why don't we use something super simple? And that's to use a pipeline approach where we have a separate um, model that is doing the extraction of um, important tokens. And then another model that, that then based on those important tokens, only on based on those important tokens, uh, can uh, predict the uh, label. The idea here is that if that second model is just predicting based on the important tokens, we know that those are important tokens. We know that those tokens must be responsible for the prediction because that's all the model sees. Okay, 
Um, and basically that's what they do in this paper and they show, yeah, if you do that, then you kind of get similar results. So uh, to kind of conclude with this, uh, this whole story about select and predict, you have seen three different approaches. Uh, I want to come back to the point I said where uh, that where I said that um, even though your explanations here should be faithful by design, such as uh, with this approach pipeline, I think it's even in the name of the paper, they say, uh, learning to faithfully rationalize by construction, meaning by design, by constructions, the highlights we extract here or rationales are going to be faithful. Um, and what Jacobi and, Tull, uh, Jacobi and Goldberg, excuse me, had told us, well, watch out, even those can be suspicious. So in this paper, they uh, represent an argument called Trojan explanations. Uh, and this kind of explanation is constructed as follow, following. Um, imagine that the selector makes a prediction and it codes uh, the predicted label in a highlight pattern age. And then it returns the highlighted text uh, age um, times X, which means that you mask tokens that are not important. The predictor recovers age, the binary mask, and the codes the predicted label from the mask pattern age without relying on the text. What this is saying in simpler terms that maybe your mask, your highlight, your, your mask age has some kind of bias. Maybe it's always biasing in the beginning uh, of the text for the, for the given label. And so the model, the predictor, doesn't really need to understand the words you have, the content, the meaning of the words you have given it. You can just understand, well, there is some masking happening in the beginning, and I have learned a spurious correlation between highlighting in the beginning and predicting, let's say, positive sentiment label. So even though um, it should be doing the prediction based on the content of words that are highlighted alone, it still has, it, certain biases can still creep in. And the powerful model, um, powerful neural model can, can pick on those, those biases. So yeah, watch out. If you are um, using any kind of these select and predict or uh, faithful by construction approaches, have in mind that uh, there are still certain biases that can happen. All right, so um, this is kind of recap of highlighting an input attribution. Here I crossed out gradient based because I have introduced select and predict, which is not uh, gradient based. And um, so, so in the approach here, I have added you a few more. So first I said we can use gradient uh, to, to find important tokens in a post hoc manner. Now we have learned about select and predict, but have in mind that these two are not only gradient, uh, excuse me, only input attribution methods out there. There are way, 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 way more, such as leave one out and lime that you will see uh, in a lot of papers. Um, so yeah, we can't go over every single method in this class, uh, just know that more exists. And then everything else stays the same even for select and predict uh, highlights.